Well, thank you very much. And thank you very much for having us. Um, we, uh, you know, this is fresh. <laughs> so uh, we appreciate all kinds of feedback uh, and comments. And what the paper is about, you know, with a grandiose title is uh, the US net foreign asset position. And what I'm showing in this graph is a picture of the US net foreign asset position relative to GDP since 1992. Just to remember the net foreign asset position is a comparison or a, a netting of the market value of the assets that US residents own abroad and the market value of assets that foreign residents own in the United States. And what I want you to see in this picture is that you know, since in the last decade, say since 2009 or 2010, this line has dropped considerably relative to GDP, uh, maybe by 40 or 45 percentage points of GDP. So, you know, after a long period of relative stability of the US net foreign asset position, what we've seen in the last 10 years is this very big decline. And uh, what our paper's about is really two questions, you know, just mechanically what happened, what accounts for this decline in the data, that'd be the first one. And then the second one is what might this mean for the welfare uh, of Americans or American residents? Um, so the first part, in the first part of the paper and in this talk, you know, we really benefit from uh, all the work that the BEA and the Treasury and others have done to construct the integrated macroeconomic accounts, which gives you an integrated view of flows and balance sheets and valuation changes, you know, not just externally, but for many sectors in the US economy. And, and this is an innovation in national government product accounting that's occurred in the last 10 years. Um, so our lives are a lot easier than researchers before us who had to do a lot of this work. Uh, themselves. But in terms of thinking about the accounting of what went on, obviously the early thoughts about the US current account, you know, going back to the 1980s, really just emphasized that the net foreign asset position was going to be the result of accumulated current account deficits. Uh, and that, you know, in the 1980s, as we were running, started running these deficits, there was concern that we would build up a big negative net foreign asset position as a result. And then we had several decades, as we saw in this figure, even by 2007, the US net foreign asset position really hadn't deteriorated very much relative to GDP, despite the fact that the US had continued running current account deficits uh, for quite some time. And you know, a very important literature with Gorinchus and Ray being the pioneers, emphasized that um, valuation effects uh, or ex, you know, ex post differences in the realized rate of return that Americans earned on assets abroad versus what foreigners earned on assets in the US were playing a very important role uh, in giving you this gap between the evolution of the net foreign asset position and the accumulated current accounts. And there was a view that came up that that was a result of an asymmetry in the US gross asset positions. There was a view that the US uh, was basically owned a lot of equity abroad and borrowed to do so, so that we, you know, there was a view that the US was basically a levered equity portfolio on the rest of the world. Okay, but in, in the data that we have, you know, over the last 10 years, I think the data challenge both of these views. So, you know, in the last 10 years, what we've seen is that in fact, um, foreigners have earned a much higher rate of return on the assets they hold in the US than Americans have earned on their assets abroad. And that is really arising from the fact that in the data, in the data that we have now, uh, foreigners own quite a bit of equity in the United States. In fact, the equity positions that foreigners have in the United States are essentially the same size as the equity position that Americans have abroad. So uh, what we've seen in the last 10 years is two things. Uh, the conventional view of the US you know, gross asset position you know, is 
no longer true. It's basically uh, balanced equity positions, uh, gross equity positions in both directions. And uh, the question of whether valuation effects favor the US or not, is not a question about does equity outperform bonds. It's just a question of whose equity does better. And what's happened in the last decade is the US stock market has just boomed tremendously and foreign equities have not. And hence, as a result of their ownership of US equities, foreigners have enjoyed very favorable valuation effects and these have driven the large decline in the US net foreign asset position. Okay, so then what does this mean for Americans? So to address that question, we really need a theory of what's going on. And so in the second part of the paper, we turn to this you know, rapidly growing macro finance literature that you know, looks at the valuation of US corporations and tries to understand you know, the, the recent stock market boom and previous you know, stock market behavior. And in particular, we're gonna be doing kind of a, a simplified version of the Fari Gurio paper uh, that looked at you know, the, the valuation of US corporations in a closed economy, and we're gonna do it in an open economy. And this is gonna allow us to think about the net foreign asset position and the welfare implications. And we're gonna end up focusing on a story embedded in their model that it's rising markups at, you know, being charged by US firms that is uh, accounting for the boom, a, a large portion of the boom in asset values. And what we're gonna argue is that if that is the correct interpretation, then the decline in the US net foreign asset position is a symptom of a, a large welfare cost for American residents. And we're gonna argue that kind of the best way to think about that welfare loss is that if American corporations have increased their markups uh, and uh, foreigners own a large portion of the equity of those corporations, then in, the, in terms of the economics of what's going on, it's equivalent to what would have happened if the US government just levied a value added tax and then used some of that revenue to just make gifts to foreigners. And that's why you get a substantial uh, welfare cost. Now, we are gonna have changes in discount and growth rates, and those will play a role, you know, as in the Fari Gurio paper, it wasn't all markups. Um, but there's an alternative story out there for the boom in asset values in the macro finance literature, which is what's going on is that US firms are actually investing in a new type of capital that is not measured and that it's not rising markup so much as it is increased investment in this new capital that accounts for uh, the boom in US asset values. And so we're gonna have a version of our model that examines that hypothesis and will point out that it's very difficult to tell the unmeasured capital model from the rising markups model if you just use closed economy data. They're basically isomorphic on the balanced growth path in their implications for asset valuation and key macroeconomic ratios, but they have strikingly different implications in the transition into an open economy. Basically, if it, if it was an investment in unmeasured capital that uh, uh, was driving the boom in asset values, we'll argue that the decline in uh, the net foreign asset position would have been much larger and it would have been accompanied by a dramatic deterioration in the current account, largely because we would have been borrowing from abroad to finance all this, you know, this boom in investment. Okay, so that is the, uh, uh, the introduction to the two parts of the model, I mean, two parts of the paper and the talk. Let me uh, get into the first part, which is just kind of in the data you know, what happened. All right, so the, the first thing we wanna do is, to, is decompose this decline in the US net foreign asset position relative to GDP into parts that are due to uh, the current account, which we'll call net lending abroad, valuation effects, which are measured in the integrated macroeconomic accounts. They're not a residual. And then a statistical discrepancy which is very largely a difference between the financial flows that are implied 
by the current account, which measures flows of goods and services and net factor income, and the financial flows that are directly measured in the integrated macroeconomic accounts. So um, we're going to... I, can I jump in real quick? We have a question from uh, Robert Coleman uh, that says, can the recent fall in the US NFA be interpreted as a manifestation of international risk sharing? The US real economy has performed better than Europe and other parts of the world. So risk sharing then calls for a US wealth transfer to the rest of the world and a fall in the NFA. Uh, that's a theoretically a possibility, but that's not uh, <laughs> the one we're gonna be emphasizing. I think that, uh, yeah. We will, uh, uh, yeah, let's put that in the discussion period if we might. Um, the, uh, uh, okay, so continuing. So we're basically gonna be looking at this decomposition of the change in the net foreign asset position over you know, the period of time. And I'll show you it in this graph. So we take those cumulative sums, you know, what the net foreign asset position is relative to GDP is the blue line. You accumulate the current account up to a date, divide by GDP at that date, and that is this kind of yellowish orange line. And so, you know, that's the current account. The green line is the measured valuation effects, and the red line is the statistical discrepancy, again, accumulated divided by GDP. So the orange line, the green line, and the red line add up to the blue line at each date. And so in the decomposition that we have, what we see is that in the early period, we had a substantial decline, say to 2007, in the accumulated current account, but the net foreign asset position up here wasn't nearly as bad because a combination of valuation effects going in favor of the US here and a bit of a statistical discrepancy uh, then meant that despite the fact that we were running large current account deficits and this accumulated sum was growing, the uh, net foreign asset position actually moved in favor of the United States in the early 2000s. And then the last decade, what we see is that the the current accounts that the US had been running have been modest, which means that this sum relative to GDP isn't growing. You see that this line is largely flat for a decade. The statistical discrepancy isn't really doing anything interesting either. What's going on is that we have a large decline in the accumulated valuation effects. And so this differential from about this point to this point accounts for a large portion of this decline in the blue line from this point, say, to that point. And so this is, you know, why we call it kind of the end of privilege. Uh, this is just in, a, in the decomposition valuation effects are going uh, very sharply against the US. Okay, so um, if we dig into these valuation effects, you kind of need, you know, in the measured valuation effects, you need two things to be going on for them to be substantial. You need large gross positions in terms of US foreign assets and US liabilities. And then you need big differences in the realized uh, you know, price changes, capital gains and losses on uh, the two positions. And uh, so we're gonna see that both of those are true, that uh, uh, the US has large gross asset positions, that the valuation effects in the data are driven almost entirely by equity. So not only do we have large gross asset positions, but we have large gross equity positions as well on both sides. And as I mentioned, they're roughly balanced. Let me say that throughout this talk, when I use the word equity, I'm going to be talking about both portfolio equity and FDI equity. And this will be important. And you know, they're handled a certain way in the data that we perhaps will discuss in the discussion period. So this is, you know, when you're when I'm talking about equity, you should be thinking about people buying publicly traded stocks on one side, but also multinationals who have subsidiaries, US companies abroad and foreign companies in the United States. There's equity components of that that are also measured in the integrated macroeconomic accounts. And um, so, uh, you know, this, will, this theme would come up. And basically, 
What we'll argue in the valuation effects is that US equity surged over the past decade, foreign equity did not, and that's why the things went you know, against the US. So first off, this is just a picture of the accumulated um, uh, valuation effects divided up into the portion that's associated with equity assets. So that's portfolio and FDI equity and the non-equity assets, which is everything else. And so you see that, you know, essentially the bond position, nothing much interesting is happening. Equity is, is, is doing the work. And, and at first it went in favor of the US and then it went against the US. Um, in terms of the gross positions being large and roughly balanced, this is a decomposition of gross assets and liability into equity and everything else, equity in blue, relative to GDP, always US GDP. So you can kind of see in 2000, it was a little over 40% and 40%. And in 2020, it was 80%. And before COVID, it was 80%. So, you know, this is where we're saying that the equity, the gross equity positions uh, are roughly balanced and they're clearly large and they've grown a lot uh, relative to GDP. Um, and when you think about, you know, obviously international valuation effects, uh, they could be driven by changes in, in exchange rates or changes in stock prices. And what we'll see in the two valuation episodes that we've seen in the data, the period leading up to 2007, where things went you know, in favor of the US, and then say since 2010, where things uh, uh, went against the US, is that uh, different drivers, exchange rates and stock prices are key in the two different episodes. So and Andy, could I ask you a question? Sure. This is Matteo. So uh, yeah. one, and if you haven't looked into this, just you know, think of it as, as a suggestion rather than a question. I mean, I know this is an early paper, but uh, you know, in the early part of the literature, when the valuation effects were at its highest, uh, Warnock and Kurkuro, for example, had a paper um, arguing that a lot of those valuation effects aren't valuation effects, they're discoveries of assets abroad by the US statistical office that don't get reflected into restatement of the current accounts. Um, and you know, they took a, a view of this and they, they took the view that if you corrected for that, there was little discrepancy to begin with between the NFA and the cumulative current account. And there was a debate about this. Um, I'm wondering you know, how you're thinking about that. Okay. Uh, so you're showing the NFA to go up and down all right, so the, the BEA in 2006 wrote a pretty strong response to that hypothesis, rejecting it. So we, we can also do the decomposition. So this decomposition, if you put the statistical discrepancy and the net lending abroad together, what you have is measured financial flows. And then you have the valuation effects are measured financial effect. Uh, uh, measured valuation effects. And the decomposition, we put the alternative decomposition in the paper. So if you want to say, the, you know, how do we account for the recorded change in the NFA, it's still the case that measured valuation effects over the past decade play the overwhelming role in, in accounting for them. Now, you could say maybe there's some unobserved assets that are out there together with some unobserved flow and something might be going on with those. But what we're discussing is, you know, what is in the, uh, the, the data. So that particular story that there's some unobserved flows on this end that would then explain the observed decline in the NFA, you know, we don't believe that that, uh, that works. Um, so the-, the Thank you. Uh, yeah, I thought you were going to ask a different question, which I might as well say because you're kind of the expert on it, and uh, uh, we'll put it in the discussion period, is that there may be a very large missing U.S. asset, which is a U.S. residents' position in offshore hedge funds. We'll have a discussion of that. Uh, we have a little discussion of that in the paper 
Um, but we can come back to that in the discussion section. I try to break the tradition of asking about my own work. <laughs> oh, we can um, thank you in doing that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, the other question I had for you is, um, so you mentioned a distinction between FDI and portfolio equity. Now in the earlier literature, in the run-up of the valuation effects, uh, people had taken the view, again, with some debates, that the run-up was driven by the FDI component of equity. And so far, I think when you looked at, in your story, if I get it right, the run down, you're thinking is more of the public equity component or- I'll show you, yeah, I'll that's what the book is right here. I'll wait. Okay, so just for everyone else in the background, starting in 2019, the BA did this switch of measuring FDI equity. They used to do it at what they call current cost which was more in line of how they measure the capital stock. And then they switched to doing it at market value. So they had to attribute market values to FDI equity. Um, so, so anyone looking at the data, the data switched in like the middle of 2019 because of that. So maybe this graph is hard to read. So what's in this graph is we accumulate the total revaluation effects the orange in blue, the orange relative to GDP, the orange line is equity and FDI revaluations, putting them together. So the orange line and the blue line being very similar is our point that this broad notion of equity accounts for you know, most of the valuation effects. Now, the green line is just counting the revaluation effects on portfolio equity. So what you see is in this run up in this period, you know, it's a dampened version. And in the run down, the portfolio equity is a dampened version as well. So the the what we believe what's going on there is is they're using public equity prices to assign market valuation to FDI equity, you know, in the same way they, they do for equity that's not publicly traded, you know, in the, in the regular flow of funds. And so because there's a bunch of FDI equity, the valuation effects get amplified when you apply, you know, public stock indices to value the, 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 uh, the FDI equity. But, you know, it, and John Maria Malesi Ferretti has a nice blog entry on this topic recently that you know, raises questions that we can do in the discussion period about the valuation of uh, FDI equity. But you still see there's, what is this? 10, maybe 15 percentage points of the decline in valuation is coming from the portfolio equity. Um, you know, but this is obviously a good bit bigger. So, so, so uh, you know, whatever. FDI equity is, is playing an important role that we should discuss. Okay, so I did this. So what I wanted to say about the two valuation episodes was in the run up to 2007, when valuation effects were going in the favor of the US, um, a lot of it was actually the exchange rate. If you take the MSCI stock, in, you know, stock indices for you know, the world X US, the local currency indices were not you know, booming that, I mean, they were doing fine, but that it was really the dollar returns on those, uh, the, the, the dollar index was doing much better. And so this gap here was the Im influence of the exchange rate in the, in the run up in the dollar valuation of US uh, equity held abroad. In this episode, you know, in the last 10 years, uh, we see the dollar stock price is really soaring relative to either version of the world stock price. So the exchange rate considerations have actually, I guess, made it a little bit worse uh, relative to the local currency indices. Uh, but you can see that it's really a boom in the, in the uh, uh, US stock market that is playing the big role in the last decade. Okay, so just a summary, we have this decline in the NFA position of the last decade of about uh, 45 percentage points of GDP. The current account, you know, accumulated accounts for some of this, about 10%, you know, about 35% is equity revaluation effects. And I guess we saw that these revaluation effects are about half portfolio and half FDI equity. 
All right, so that's the summary of kind of mechanically what happened. Um, let's go into what does this mean for Americans? Um, so as, as I said in the introduction, uh, we're gonna be building a model that has the capacity to think about a couple of different hypotheses. And the one we're gonna end up emphasizing is one you know, rise in markups. Uh, and so we have a big connection also to the greenwald Natal ludvigsen paper about what, how wealth was won, where they emphasize that the, the boom in the US stock market was attributed to, and this is a key word, an unpredicted and unpredictable sequence of factor share shocks. So uh, uh, we'll get to the importance of this distinction between is the boom in the US stock market an unanticipated capital gain for foreigners? Or is it a change down here in investment opportunities uh, towards that favored unmeasured capital, and then, then that led to a, a, a capital gain? And so we'll say we'll get very different welfare implications from, from these two potential stories. And we're going to also build into the model the, the path capacity for a change in discount factors um, and growth rates. OK. So we're gonna have a very simple model following Fari and Gurio. We're gonna have, you know, the miles on a balanced growth path. There's gonna be a shock. It transitions very quickly to a new balanced growth path. And we look at what happens uh, between the balanced growth paths. But the innovation relative to Fari and Gurio is, is that we've extended it to an international setting. And what we wanna hit with the model you know, relative to some other papers is kind of the standard asset pricing benchmarks, which would be the rate, the value of the stock market relative to GDP, we'll call that the Buffett ratio or the Buffett indicator, the value of the stock market relative to measured capital. So we'd call that Tobin's Q, the price dividend ratio, or actually we're gonna use the dividend yield. So dividends to prices and the price earnings ratio and we want the model to account for all of those changes. And uh, I'll just say quickly that, you know, these four asset pricing moments on a bonds growth path will also tell you uh, uh, some key macro moments, which would be like the capital output ratio here, the measured capital to measured output ratio. And these two, you know, using these two ratios on a bonds growth path, uh, you can figure out what uh, the labor share is and the ratio of consumption to GDP and the ratio of investment to GDP. So there's a lot of, you know, you could list more macroeconomic moments, but there's a, a, some of them are just implications of others. So we're gonna focus on these asset pricing moments. And we're gonna look at the corresponding implications once we have a shock to the net foreign asset position and, and US welfare. Okay, so we're gonna actually have the US, well, we call it a small open economy, but it's, it's actually a world general equilibrium, but the foreigners have linear utility. So they're gonna pin down uh, the world interest rate. And that interest rate is the, the, the rate at which you're gonna value capital. Um, within the US firms are gonna compete monopolistically so the value of those firms is gonna be a combination of the value of their physical capital and their claims to future monopoly profits. We're gonna handle portfolios in a very rudimentary way. We're gonna assume that the gross equity portfolios of US residents and foreign residents are fixed. Um, we're thinking about this that, you know, for two reasons, one, we don't, have a model, a full model with shocks, with risk sharing, and so we can't really address optimal portfolio. But also given that a large portion of the equity portfolios are actually foreign direct investment, our sense is, is that the decision to engage in foreign direct investment is not as much a port, you know, a portfolio consideration as it is a, you know, an optimal business or trade uh, consideration. So with those portfolios being fixed, the residents in the two countries can experience capital gains and losses on their portfolios. But if you actually want to have a flow, it's going to be done in a risk-free bond. 
So uh, if you're going to have a current account deficit, you finance it with a risk-free bond. And we're going to be on a balanced growth path and have an unanticipated permanent shock to markups due to a productivity differential, differential between leader and competitor firms uh, that I'll explain. And we'll at the same time have potential changes in the discount factor and the growth rates. Okay, so in this model, we'll have a final output in the United States is in the corporate sector is produced from a continuum of intermediate goods. This will be our monopolistically competitive firms that are earning, you know, going to earn some monopoly profits. We have to recognize the fact that the corporate sector is only a portion of total GDP in the US. That portion has been relatively stable for some time. So we're just in the model going to set that at 57% of total output. And we're thinking that the rest of the world does not have an ability to, you know, invest in the non corporate sector of the United States. The um, of these monopolistically competitive firms, we're going to be thinking of markups being determined through Bertrand competition between a leading firm that has a certain productivity ZH and a latent follower with productivity ZL. So it's not going to be determined by a, an elasticity of demand curve, but instead this latent Bertrand competition, this is a model I think was pioneered by uh, Let's see if I get the names right. Bernard, Eaton, Jensen, and Cordham in their 2003 model. And then Michael Peters has a recent model that has this type of model of markups as well. Okay. So these monopolistically competitive firms are going to rent capital and labor, higher labor at a wage rate. And there's going to be trend growth in, you know, driven by growth in labor augmenting technical change at rate G. So these Zs are the ZH and the ZL that'll be fixed over time. And then this is what's growing over time to generate growth in the economy. So the markups chosen by these monopolistically competitive firms would be the minimum of what would be the pure monopoly markup from the elasticity of demand for the differentiated products. And then this gap between productivities of leader and follower firms, which is the limited pricing, and so we're going to assume that this is the is the relevant gap, and the, you know the idea here is you're you're charging the highest price you can, consistent with the follower not coming in. There's going to be a second set of firms that manage the U.S. physical capital stock, and all they do is you know invest in capital and rent it out. And they're going to choose a path for the capital stock that maximizes their dividends, which is this term, the discounted present value of that. Okay, US households are going to have GHH preferences. What this does for us is it allows us to actually solve the production side of the model completely independently of the wealth of US households. So this will be convenient to give a separation between the implications of the model for asset values and, and GDP and all the rest of that from the question of who owns the various assets and who's getting income from them. So that'll give a nice tractability in terms of separating the two. All right, so the portfolios I mentioned, which are US households and foreign households as well, own fixed fractions of each other's firms. And then they trade a risk-free bond. So if you look at a sequence budget constraint, say for the US households, their consumption and new bond pur purchases is just their labor income. The old bonds pay off with some interest. And then they get a fraction of the dividends, the total dividends being paid by the um, uh, US firms and the foreign firms. And the dividends being paid by US firms and symmetric for foreigners is the uh, dividend coming from the physical capital firm, which is the rental rate minus investment plus the monopoly profits being earned in aggregate by the intermediate goods firms. 
and then equity is valued at the discounted present value of dividends. So in this model, and you know, Fari Gurio kind of showed how to do it quite simply, the way you divide GDP up in terms of compensation to the various factors is alpha, remember, is the, is the share of capital in the Cobb Douglas production function. The share of physical capital in corporate output is just reduced by the markup. The share of labor is reduced by the markup. And the intermediate goods firms get monopoly profits that go up in the markup. The, because capital you know, can be drawn from abroad at, at uh, rate, interest rate R, the rental rate on capital is pinned down. And that actually pins down the wage rate too, because the price of final output is normalized to one. And with GHH preferences, then that also pins down the amount of labor that's going on independent of the consumption of US households. So that's the separation that I mentioned. And if you look at uh, in the model, what are what we call dividends are GDP minus wages minus investment. It's important to remember that we're using this word dividends different from the standard usage in two ways. One is it's, um, uh, it's not just dividends paid to equity, it's resources that could be paid to bondholders in the firms as well if they issued bond. And the other thing is we don't have the firms accumulating financial assets, uh, which is you know, something they actually do in the data. So the right way to think about our notions of dividends and earnings is these are the cash flows from operations in the United States that are available to be paid out to investors. That's be the dividends. And that would be the corresponding measure of earnings down here. All right. So how do asset values work in this economy? Uh, the, the, you know, the value of the firms, the combination of the monopolistically competitive and, and capital managing firm in the US is the discounted present value of the dividends. But it's straightforward to work out that the capital firm is valued, you know, Tobin's Q works for that firm. So its value is just the capital stock it has at the end of each period. And then you just have the discounted present value of monopoly profits added on to this as well, coming from the uh, intermediate goods firms. Okay, so on a balanced growth path, we have pretty simple formulas for our various uh, asset pricing ratios that we're interested in. The value of the stock market relative to GDP is just the capital output ratio plus a valuation of the fraction of GDP that is monopoly profits as a perp growing perpetuity, one over R star minus G. The capital output ratio in the corporate sector itself is a standard formula. This is the rental rate in equilibrium down here. This is an adjustment for the monopoly wedge. And then, you know, we're using the fact that the corporate sector is 57% of total GDP when we do the comparisons. Tobin's Q is implied by the ratio of these. The earnings price ratio or the PE ratio and the dividend price ratio are given, well, I wanna point out the dividend price ratio is very standard, R minus G. A lot of people focus on PE ratios or this would be earnings yields as an indicator of the rate of return but in a growing economy, when Tobin's Q doesn't hold, that's not correct. That we can get the earnings yield or the price earnings ratio to move, even if the rate of return doesn't move, because Tobin's Q here moves if this growth rate is non zero. And so that's going to actually end up playing an important role in accounting for what's going on in the data, the divergence between the, the dividend price ratio and the earnings price ratio. Uh, that we see in the data. And then as a fifth moment, we could use the labor share, the growth rate, the ratio of investment to GDP. There's a lot of different things we can use. We'll go ahead and use the labor share. So we have matching the model to data, we have five moments and five parameters, and you can just go ahead and match the model to data. So let me talk for a second about, I think I have a little less than 10 minutes, <clears throat> 
but you've about, got about seven or eight minutes. Yeah. Uh, about what's happened to the asset pricing ratio when we take the measurement perspective that we do. So what we're interested in doing is, is measuring the market value of the non-financial assets owned by the US corporate sector. And so there's a couple of things one has to keep in mind. One is we're talking about the US resident corporate sector. So we're including all of the subsidiaries of foreign multinationals operating in the US because those are included in the value added produced by the US corporate sector. We're merging the non-financial sector and the financial sector because there's substantial foreign investment in both of those corporate sectors. And, um, uh, and so when we you know, value, fir value firms, we have to pay attention to the fact that a lot of US corporations have operations abroad and we want to do some accounting for that. So this corporate balance sheet, I hope, <laughs> can organize. It corresponds to what is in the integrated macroeconomic accounts for these two sectors, the non-financial corporate sector and the financial business sector. And so this is a schematic of how we use the data there. There's assets and liabilities listed for you know, the firms in these two sectors. It's all measured, as I mentioned, on the residence principle that we're including any corporation that's incorporated in the US, including subsidiaries of foreigners and hence excluding subsidiaries abroad of US companies. They list on this balance sheet the replacement value of the non-financial assets. And then they list a bunch of financial assets, including US FDI abroad. On the liability side, they list the market value of equity, and then they list a bunch of financial liabilities, including foreign FDI in the United States. So we have directly from the data an estimate of the replacement value of these non-financial assets. To construct a market valuation of these non-financial assets, we add up the market value of equity, the financial liabilities, and subtract off the financial assets and we call that the enterprise value of these non-financial assets. And so just looking at what's happened to those two different measures of the value of US corporation, the replacement value of their capital stock relative to GDP has barely moved over this time period. On the other hand, the market value you know, surged in the tech boom came down and then has surged dramatically. I should call this the enterprise value has surged dramatically uh, by about 150 percentage points of GDP in the last uh, 10 years. Okay, so what we've seen is this big boom in what I'll call the enterprise value of US corporations in the last 10 years with little change in the measured capital output ratio. The price earnings ratio measured using NIPA concepts has gone, let's say from, I don't know, 17 and a half uh, up near 27 and a half. So that's risen substantially. And this type of PE ratio is in line with other PE ratios you'd measure, uh, you know, like Schiller CAPE or stuff like that. On the other hand, the dividend yield was, you know, bumps around was about 3% before in the financial crisis uh, uh, dramatically changed. And then it's kind of settled in into being 3% again. And this is actually consistent with dividend yields on the S&P 500 that for the last decade, they haven't really moved. They've been about 2%, okay. And so how do you get little change in the dividend yield when you have a big boom in the valuation of assets? What kind of, in terms of the resources available to pay out from US corporations relative to GDP is just jumped tremendously in the past 10 years. And so, you know, we would say it's not so much of a mystery why the US stock market boomed, uh, just US corporations are spitting out a lot more resources available to their investors than was true in the past. Okay, so uh, taking those as asset pricing targets, 
what we do is calibrate to two different balanced growth paths. The pre, say, 2009 balanced growth path, we had five parameters and five moments that we're looking to hit. And so we have a relatively high you know, cost of capital, uh, a relatively high growth rate, a very modest markup, a capital share of about a third and a depreciation rate of about 10%. We leave these two the same when we, you know, and these are the implied asset pricing moments. And then when we go to post 2009, we, we get the movement in the PE ratio going to 27, the dividend price ratio staying the same, the Buffett ratio going up by 150 percentage points of GDP, capital output barely moving and the labor share dropping by five percentage points. And so two things are happening. The, R and G are falling in parallel, so R minus G stays the same, and a huge increase uh, in the markup mu is doing that. Okay, to finish the welfare implications, we need to know how much equity foreigners own. So we've taken a measure of foreign ownership of US equity, both portfolio and equity, FDI relative to our measure of enterprise value of US corporations, that's you know, over a third in the last decade, we're gonna actually calibrate to 30% connected to this issue about hedge funds that we'll discuss in the discussion period. I'm gonna skip this because of time. Well, basically we'll discuss what we do. We start the US off with a negative 20% of GDP net foreign asset position. We actually are using log utilities. So if R and G change in parallel, US consumption growth continues to grow at the rate G. Uh, we set a labor supply elasticity equal to two and the GHH preferences and capital can be instantly reallocated when the shock occurs. So the transition's immediate. So when you have a markup shock, what happens to the net foreign asset position depends a great deal on who owns the equity in US firms. And so on this axis, we're showing if Americans owned all the equity, that's one, you know, one here, land is one, then the shock doesn't really do much at all to the current account, the net foreign asset position. There's a little bit of a foreign asset revaluation, a little bit of stuff goes on, but nothing much happens. On the other hand, if foreigners own more and more of US equity, this is going to foreigners owning it all. If you go to they own 30%, then you get you know, a very little current account, but a large drop, you know, about 45 percentage points of GDP in the net foreign asset position, driven overwhelmingly by the revaluation of uh, foreigners' claims on uh, US assets. And you know, what is this coming from? Well, you can basically think about it. If US stock, if US corporations boom by 150 percentage points of GDP and foreigners own 30% of that, then they pick up 45% of US GDP in their asset valuation. It's a you know, the other effects are are, are minor. So that that back of the envelope calculation kind of works. What happens to welfare? Well, there's a lot of stuff that happens to welfare connected to what are the productivity shocks that made markups occur? What is the change in growth rate on welfare? That actually has a huge Im implication for welfare. But in this graph, we show we normalize the welfare change, you know, to if Americans owned everything and compare what is the consumption equivalent variation that occurs as we have foreigners own more and more US stock. And you see here that uh, if foreigners own 30% of the equity, then the uh, you get about a two and a half percentage point consumption, uh, consumption equivalent variation loss for Americans. A way to think about that is the fraction of GDP that's going to profits is going up by nearly 10 percentage points of GDP the foreigners are getting 30% of that. And so that accounts for, you know, the loss of welfare that we're just handing foreigners uh, a lot of money in this. 
All right, we, Andy, we got to wrap pretty yeah, soon. Yeah, this is it. What have we did unmeasured capital? The key idea with unmeasured capital is Tobin's Q holds. If you include both measured and unmeasured capital, you make adjustments for the fact that output measured, you do the thing, you show they're isomorphic. If we had a shock to the production function that made unmeasured capital much more um, uh, important in production, then what has to happen is somebody has to finance a huge increase in investment, even though it's unmeasured. And if you're going to make the value of US corporations go up by 150 percentage points of GDP, there are some small effects, but it's essentially you need a change in the net foreign asset position, a negative change of 150 percentage points of GDP, which we just didn't see. So we're not a fan of that story. So that's basically it. <laughs> we talked about the, what drove the change in the US net foreign asset position in a pure accounting sense. And then we talked about uh, two different stories of why stock market might rise, unanticipated shock to markups versus a change in the, uh, in the production structure of the economy to emphasize unmeasured capital. And as we, you know, the theme there is that in a closed economy, it's very hard to tell those two hypotheses apart, but in an open economy, it's pretty straightforward. All right, thank you. Great, uh, thanks a lot, Andy. So now we'll turn to the Q&A phase. If you have a question, feel free to raise your hand and I can promote you uh, and allow you to talk. Um, I think we can maybe kick off first with uh, some of this discussion that we were having surrounding uh, hedge funds and offshore accounts. I think, Matteo, did you want to uh, say something? Sorry, no, I, I was going to go for something else. Oh, okay, go ahead then. Yep. Um, uh, so I wonder, Andy, if you can elaborate on the ex ante versus ex post uh, interpretation of what happened. I mean, here's three very different models. One model is the privilege is all about the returns of U.S. equity versus foreign equity. Uh, I would put, for example, studies about U.S. multinational stock shenanigans in that category. And then it gets the right object to look at is what has driven the last 20 years. And you know, you say, look, there's an export shock to markup that has really driven this. Another very, very different story is this is all about um, you know, borrowing cheap in debt uh, versus equity positions. A third story is, look, equity positions are large and balanced. They're very volatile, so they're going to dominate the data exposed. But the privilege ex ante is about 20 basis points on treasuries. And yeah, sure, in, compared to ex post variation, it's going to be very small, but it's the only part that is predictable. And that's what we should focus on. Those, those are all different interpretations of the data, and I'm wondering how you're thinking about them. OK, so. The valuation effects as they're measured, I'm trying to find the right slide for this. They're measured, this is a very close, you know, small schematic. So you have, a, you have a stock of equity, assets and liabilities, and then you have some capital gain or capital loss that is, is then attributed to those stocks. And think about it this way. So we obviously had a capital gain in US equity. So this term was very big. If, so one shock is unanticipated. So remember the total return on equity is the dividend plus the capital gain. And so you could have an unanticipated shock is you have like no change in dividends and all of a sudden a big capital gain appears. That's the market shock. The unmeasured capital shock is the way you get the big capital gain is to have a massively negative dividend. If firms are doing tons of unmeasured investment, those investments are expensed. And so they're not paid out to investors. And uh, so you get this massively negative dividend. So the total return on equity actually is not high. And, and that, you know, in the model. And so, and we think in the data, that's a key distinction as well. What's called valuation effects is just the capital gain component but is not including you know, changes in, in dividends. And, and again, I'm, this is this broad notion of dividends. So the, 
The way to think about it is if you just have a change in investment opportunities because the production function changed, there's no welfare gain. Somebody has to give up consumption to a first order. Somebody has to give up consumption to do the investment to take advantage of this opportunity. And, 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 and that to a first order leads to no change in welfare in the transition. Whereas if you have an unanticipated total return, you know, excess return, then that's just a gift to somebody. And, and then it's equity diversification determines who gets the gift. Did that help? Mateo? Uh, somewhat, um, I, you we know, I, I, unfortunately. The, we put some accounting at the end of the paper we, we, where we reorganized you know, into a different definition of valuation effects, which is uh, uh, excess returns taking into account both dividends and-, and No, I, I think I get that part. I guess I, I was going for um, a little bit of a difference with what the notion of privilege even is in the data. I mean, when we look at the data that many authors will have identified very different things as being the privilege. I mean, you could imagine the privilege is the dynamic of the valuation effects, or you could say that's largely driven by other factors that have nothing to do with my definition of privilege, like, uh, you know, equity performance. And I want to look at 20 basis points difference between treasuries and other forms of safe debt. And so I was, you know, you're taking a, a particular view of privilege, um, which I think is interesting. And there's nothing wrong. I just wanted to see how you're thinking about that. Okay, so um, there are some you know, alternative views. So one would, I mean, there was an effort in the earlier literature to say that the ex post valuation effects going in favor of the US up to 2007 also reflected an ex ante difference in expected returns because equity has a higher return than bonds. But, you know, that's very hard to establish given the variability of returns, any standard error on any yeah, that, that's exactly what I was going from. Um, yeah. That so exposed, you're, you're, not, you're, you're not gonna be able to tell it apart one way yeah. or another. So, so in what we're doing, all expected returns are the same and everything is an ex post, yeah. you know, it's a it's an ex post difference that matters. That makes sense. And uh, unfortunately I have to leave because I, I, I'm giving a seminar today, but um, on, on, the, on the offshore part, uh, just because it's come up several times and I haven't asked this. My sense is actually for, for what you're doing, at least the portfolio part, it's not going to make a huge difference. Well, Imagine that the US buys a hedge fund in the Caymans and the Caymans owns uh, US S&P 500. Uh, the valuation gains, as long as they're done correctly on both the assets and the liabilities will, will show up correctly okay. in your paper. They're so, just misstating the gross assets and liabilities. I want to file That's not a problem for you. I want to file something for you to look into as we're looking into it too. And I'd be curious if you have it. I'm very happy to, to, to speak more about it, but yeah, you know, I'm concerned. at least that part didn't strike me as it would be a big concern for you. Oh, good. Okay. I'll just show but, you. But we can definitely <laughs> talk more. And I, I could be wrong. This is like a you know, yeah, two second I'll, take, I'll but I didn't think that. it was going to be a big concern. Yeah, I'll correspond with that separately. Go All ahead. Right, ciao. All right, thanks. Okay, great. Uh, I think our next question comes from Robert Coleman. Robert, you should be able to unmute and talk. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Andy. It's very interesting uh, talk. I have, I have the following question. So, so if I said it correctly, you have a, you have a one shock story. Though. So there was one shock, namely a markup shock, an increase in markups. I, I wonder, can it account for the broad macro dynamics since the, uh, the financial crisis? I mean, if you just feed this macro, this markup shocks into your model, I guess you're going to see a, a recession in the US. But the fact is that, that US growth has been relatively strong compared to, uh, to the rest of the world during the, the past, say, 10, 15 years. Uh, the share of US output and world output actually has been, in. so although it has a secular downward trend, it actually has been increasing over the last 10, 10 15 years. And, and, and so I guess the explanation for that is, uh, first of all, that you know, the US economy is, is, is dynamic in general, at least compared to the rest of the world. And then you have this massive uh, monetary and fiscal uh, stimulus, uh, much bigger than, than in the rest of the world. So, so uh, uh, yeah, so my question is, how does your, your models uh, 
square with, with the basic fact that the US uh, growth rate has been comparatively high uh, over the last 10, 10 years. Uh, uh, so, so can, I, uh, can I take a shot at that? Yeah, but and, and then this is related to the question of risk sharing. You know, if 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 in the end the U.S. does better, real economic performance is higher. Then, isn't it the basic you know notion of risk sharing that that in in this particular state of the world, the U.S. should be transferring resources well to the rest of the world, and and so this has to manifest itself in in a decline in NFA, right? So so there is a more benign interpretation of of the U.S. NFA. Uh, Potentially. Let me, so let's, let me see if I can hit both of those. Okay, well, three, there's, so there's three things. We actually have a three shock story. <laughs> G, R, and mu are all changing. Um, the reason we need the G and R to change is to get the price earnings ratio to move a great deal. Uh, so that's, that's one thing. So, you know, the fact that Price earnings ratios have gone way up. A lot of people interpret that as uh, a signal of slower growth and slower returns going forward. Yeah, we we agree with that. The point you make about markups, and this is something it's good to stress. So this theory, I mean, this is important for the entire literature on markups in the US. This theory of limit pricing says there's two ways that the markup could go up. One would be, the leader firms in the US had this you know, burst of productivity growth and the latent competitors did not. And so then you know, you'd get an increase in markups because ZH goes up relative to ZL. Another story would be through failures of antitrust policy or whatever, the leader firms found some way to knock off the follower firms and you know, push them further down. And, and so that second story would be like, you know, really bad for welfare and output, I think, and that's what many people's interpretation is. The first story that, that, the, that the increase in markups is a sign of actually enhanced US productivity is a, a different picture. So we're actually calibrating the changes in ZH and ZL to get the markup to go up by the amount I had shown in that table and to keep, I think it's US output constant through the transition. And that requires a pretty big jump up in ZH. So our shock has actually embedded in it a large productivity shock for US firms, positive, to, together with an increase in markups. And so we can, or we could, you know, do the same shock to ZH, but go have ZL go in parallel and say, what would happen to the US NFA position if there was no increase in markups? And I think that would address kind of the, isn't, isn't some kind of risk sharing a good idea? Uh, and I do believe that would come out of the calculation. So that's something we could do. What we're actually looking at is then the two shocks and a substantial positive shock to ZH, which is a productivity shock, but ZL is, I think is actually falling too. So the, you know, the gap is widening and that, um, uh, that is, uh, uh, that is, has different risk sharing implications. The way to think about it is, uh, you know, the, the widening of this gap in and of itself is a bad thing for Americans, right? Because it's increasing the monopoly wedge and decreasing you know, uh, economic efficiency. And when the monopoly wedge goes up, if you're transferring resources to foreigners, you're, you're, it has, that is exactly the wrong risk sharing implication. You're sending money abroad just when you got a shock that said, you know, it's bad for you. And so, both of those things are going on in our model because we have both ZH going up and ZL going down. Uh, can, I, can, can I follow up on this, Andy? What? Can I follow up on, on this yeah. one second with Robert? I, I think that's an important point. Uh, but there is one thing which is very important here. It's about the quantity. So you said US is doing a little bit better than the rest of the world, but quantitatively, it's very, very small. You know, yeah, US maybe grows at 2%, that's the world 
So any resharing model would imply, yeah, sure, a little bit of a transfer from US to the rest of the world, but not of the scale we see, because the reason that the US stock market is going like 150% better than the rest of the world stock market. So even though in principle, it might have a, uh, the, 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 the direction of the transfer might be reconciled with optimal resharing, the size of the transfers is way bigger than any model will tell you. So it's very hard to think about this as an optimal resharing agreement. And think about even the size, like you talk about two and a half, three percent of consumption. And we all know the resharing gains are always super small. So the size is really linked, the size of the transfer is really linked to this financial development. And it's very hard to kind of think of resharing model. That's why at the end we decide not to talk about it because even though qualitatively they might, quantitatively the, the size of the transfer you see is way bigger than any model will tell you. Great. But you do rule out monetary policy as a, you know, uh, ultra loose monetary policy. That's not an explanation for, for the boom in stock prices. Uh, no. It, it, we do not have the capacity in the model to handle that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's where I put it politely. <laughs> but but it's true. I mean, it's possible that monetary policy has something to do with it. But you know, we've seen aggressive expansionary monetary policy around the world, and and long-term interest rates have been highly correlated. You know, the decline in long-term interest rates has been has been common across across most uh, developed economies, not particularly large for the U.S. So. Yeah, it might be that you know declining interest rates have something to do with it, but you you would kind of want a story where somehow U.S. stock prices are more sensitive to lower interest rates than than stock prices in the rest of the world. Um, so you could build a model like that. We we thought about, but we haven't. Um, doesn't seem like you know for this this stock is easy. To, it's hard enough to think of stories why stock values go up, but you know the challenge is to think of stories why they go up so dramatically in the U.S. and so much less anywhere else in the rest of the world. And so that. The, the rising markup story seems like it has a little bit of potential along those lines, but because there is work suggesting that you know competition, con concentration, markups have increased more in the U.S. than they have in other countries. Something you can measure uh, more, more directly. Um, so that's that sense. Okay, uh, I think we can turn. Hanno has a question now. If you want to go ahead. Um, okay, I have a I have a question about sort of an, an alternative to the. Uh, to the risk sharing story uh, that's been told in the literature is, is sort of the um, um, the story that that speaks to the role of the U.S. as, as sort of the unique supplier of, of safe assets for the rest of the world, right? And uh, and it, people have argued that that might explain why the U.S. has been able to run large current account deficits and and government deficits at the same time. And then the idea is that. Um, there's some seniorage revenue uh, that the U.S. can generate by by sort of issuing IOUs that are that are safe assets and that provide these services to the rest of the world. And then the idea is that that sort of that seniorage revenue is is maybe not properly measured when you when you sort of look at, um, uh, for example, uh, the current account when you do the the accounting. What what is it in in the data that has convinced you that that's not the right story uh, to think about this. I guess, I guess the answer is related to your point about equity uh, valuations. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing, right? But, well, okay. So first off, yeah. I'm influenced by the work of Brian Setzer, and so just in the data, there doesn't seem to be a difference in the interest rate that the U.S. pays on its on the bonds that foreigners own and the interest rate that it receives on the bonds that it owns. So there's that problem <laughs> that, the, that the excess return in terms of measured you know, factor incomes that the US gets is entirely loaded into FDI in six tax havens. And that, you know, and that's probably tax avoidance and and there's claims, you know, there's a literature on that. There's claims that that doesn't affect the measurement of the US net foreign asset position, um, it, or if, if its impact would be second order. That the claims, you know, we can discuss kind of what that is, but 
But so I, I recognize that there are deviations from covered interest parity, but they just don't. Ah, that was I, I was just going to bring that up. Yeah, but if they, you do it careful. Yeah. Yeah, but the the maybe they're screwing that up in the measurement, but it's it's not showing up in the aggregates as as anything like large, I and see. and that the. Um, I mean, it may be that the problem is the, there may be nothing comparable. I could send you the stuff from Brian Zetzer. There may be nothing comparable to the US sovereign debt position, you know, and that, but, the, but if you kind of think about it, it's like, what is the benefit of covered interest parity? Is it 20 basis points or something, 25 basis points? So then you're saying we got something that is 60% of GDP or whatever is our sovereign mm. debt position. And then you take 20 basis points of that, you know, that's, that's not going to have a big influence on what we just saw, a 45 basis point move in the net foreign asset position. It's just the wrong magnitude. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, I mean, as I've discussed with you earlier, I do see the US still has a certain kind of a privilege that we can dump a lot of fixed interest rate bonds of all kinds in the world markets. And, and there may be some valuation issues there. I'm not sure how well they handle those revaluations uh, in the data. So that, that, I mean, you and I have had a discussion and that's something I think that could take that would benefit from some work. I mean, I just saw something like uh, Austria has a hundred year bond and it fell by 40%, its price fell by 40 percentage points in 150 days because interest rates went up slightly <laughs> in euros. You know, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if that is being missed, that type of stuff is being missed in the, in the revaluation effects. I, I don't know that for sure. Yeah. 